So it is my honor this morning to bring up our speaker, uh, our deliverer of the word this morning. When I first met Roger and uh, Kathy Henry, they walked into my home group uh, at our, at our uh, house on Saturday nights, and that was April, uh, March or April, sometime around there, and instantly they were a blessing to us. They were just getting ready to go on a missions trip uh, to Romania. They do that from time to time. Uh, Kathy was actually born over there and knows way more languages than me. Uh, so she went uh, as an interpreter, and Roger uh, was on her arm, uh, supporting in, in all the ways that he can. He is a uh, evangelist. He's a uh, prophetic teacher, uh, encourager. Man, such a huge encouragement to us. They they love serving in a kingdom capacity, uh, and we're just really blessed. You guys are a gift uh, to Church at Winder, and we're so thankful that you're here. Um, so he is one of the modern sons of Issachar. If you uh, don't know where that's found in in First Chronicles 12, uh, he is uh, a man that knows, can discern what's happening around him, and is, and is uh, confident and knows how his pe- God's people need to move in order to react to what the Holy Spirit's doing. So he is a gift here, and we're just, um, we're really looking forward. He's not looking at me. He's studying over there. We're looking forward to what he's got for us uh, this morning. Roger, can you come up and we'll pray? I'll pray for you. He is an accurate, prophetic servant of the Lord and um, values the teaching of the Word. So we just... Jesus, we come to you. Father, we pray that you would anoint my brother Roger here with uh, the exact message that you have for your people here in this church. I pray that you would give us ears to hear and hearts to receive. Uh, be his mouthpiece, or let him be your mouthpiece today. And help him to bring you all the glory and honor and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Love you, man. Praise the Lord. Good morning, everybody. I'm not going to look at the clock as much as I did in the first service, so I didn't get to finish, but we're going to see where God wants to take us. It is a privilege and honor to be with you. I don't take it lightly. Uh, I take it with great fear and trembling, standing before God's people, declaring what I feel like God's saying. Uh, It's not something, again, that I just want to... uh, Brashly say, this is what I hear, or this is what I say. I want to make sure that what I'm hearing or what I'm saying is, is as close to the heart of God as it can be. So uh, I thank God for Ken and them. They've been such a blessing to us. As soon as we walked in the group, we had been without a family for a long time, and we just instantly found our tribe, and we you know, get, get to know a lot of you folks now, hopefully. Uh, I told Jeff we need to have a name tag Sunday for about two months so I can... Get everybody's name. We have so many new people, so uh, it would be a help to me, I'll be honest with you, because uh, it's, it's hard to remember everybody's names. That and Father Time's not on my side. I'm only getting older, so it's a little more difficult. So anyhow, uh, uh, just to thank my wife this morning behind every good man is a very surprised woman, and that is my very surprised woman over there. She is my good thing. The Bible says when a man finds a wife, he finds a good thing and obtains the favor of the Lord. So she is my good thing. She likes to call herself the Holy Spirit to me because she likes to fix me all the time. (laughs) Yeah. She's got her work cut out for her. I'm a handful. All right, let's pray one more time. And uh, and I want to lead us into what we feel like God's taking us this morning. Father, we thank you. God, I just so much enjoyed that worship. Honestly, I didn't want to stop. And I want us to continue. I just want this to be a small hiatus in what you're doing this morning. And I want to go right back into that vein, God, because you don't need me. You don't need anything I have to say, God, but Lord, if you require it, I'm here. And God, we ask you this morning, Doug, give us ears to hear, eyes to see, and a heart to perceive and understand what you're saying right now to Church at Winder. And God, prophetically, Lord, it's not by chance that tonight starts the beginning of the Jewish New Year, and I believe it also starts a new season for us as a church. I believe this is a new season, a new time for us, God. As we line up with your purpose, as we align with what you have for us, God, I believe that the old's passed away, the new has come. 
And we're going to begin to walk in newness of life in this congregation. So I thank and praise you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. It is odd. I didn't think about it until I was sitting there getting ready for the worship. But tonight is the start of a Jewish new year. And, and I truly believe God wants to do that in our midst. He wants to start something new and fresh. And uh, we, uh, we fall in love with the old pretty quickly, especially if it was good. Right? If it was good. We had our home group last night. Um, several people kept saying, what I had was good. And so I didn't want to really let that go to get something else. And we can fall in love with how God's worked in a certain season and a certain time in our life. And we should treasure those things. We should love and appreciate different seasons of our life. But we're not to fall in love with any one of them because seasons change. God's consistently moving. God doesn't limit himself to one experience. We should be growing from glory to glory, from faith to faith. So we can't fall in love with any one part of the process. We've got to enjoy the whole thing. I know as a father, we were talking before service and we were holding the the newest baby there and he has just got the biggest chubby cheeks you just want to kiss him and we got to talking and she her, her comment was well I like you know different times of their life too and some of the ones two years old so he's going to as, as, as we experience different levels in God and different maturity levels God enjoys every one of them but he doesn't want you to stay at one or the other he doesn't want you to be a babe for the rest of your life and, and be, be able to nurse he wants you to be able to walk and he wants you to not be able to walk he wants you to be able to do it yourself and he wants you to be able to feed yourself and talk and, do, and grow and learn. He wants us to mature as a body. It breaks the heart of God when we relegate ourselves to immaturity. And we do that when we stop at any one season that God's moving in. So it's extremely important that we be a people that are constantly in transition. Now, on the flip side, it doesn't feel very good to our soul. I don't like change. How many like change in the building? Right. Well, yes, you too. Three. Yeah, praise the Lord. I, I don't. I don't like change. I'm very much a creature of habit. And it's odd because spiritually, I love it. It's, it's my juice gets me going. But physically, I like to know when things are going to happen. I kind of enjoy a steady job. Well, set now is I would never make a great entrepreneur because I like to know what's coming next, when my next check's going to be there. You know, Brother F was an entrepreneur. God bless him. I don't know how he does it. I just, I need to know. I need to know that on Friday at midnight, this thing's going to be deposited in my, you know, I need to know. But <laughs> nobody else in here like that, I'm sure. Spiritually, though, we need to constantly be okay to be uncomfortable because God, God doesn't really care about your comfortability in the first place just so we're clear on that God didn't create you to sit in one place or to be comfortable and he really didn't ask you what you thought about it right last time I checked it's his church so I think he's wanting to take it back is what I think is really happening so we've got to be ready for that so I want to read to you a prophecy that uh, God had given me back in March early March we had been in the home group just a couple weeks and God had spoke this to my heart about where this church was locally one of the ways that God uses me when I, when I visit new churches, and it's not a new church anymore, this is my home, so I don't want to make it sound like I'm a visitor, but when I visit new churches, a lot of time God gives me a, this is where you are on a map. Anybody use maps anymore? I didn't think they made them anymore. My brother-in-law, who is a man of many, many hidden talents, we were getting ready to go somewhere, and he didn't trust the GPS on the way up here from, from Orlando. So he had books and maps because that's how he worked. And the GPS wasn't working, no problem for David. That's his name, godly man of God. He's my Russian brother-in-law. And uh, he got his maps out, and he figured out where to go and what to go, and he had everything all mapped out. Right? He had a map ready. And so it gives me great comfort when I stop at a rest area somewhere if I'm lost, and I see a map, and it says, you are here. I don't know where everything else is at, but I know this moment I'm right here on this map. So... Prophetically, God uses me that way at times when I visit new fellowships and new places to prophetically let them know this is where you're at in the spiritual progression and plan of God. And this is one of those messages this morning, a foundational message that I'm hoping will give us some insight because I know we're all feeling the transition. We're all feeling the change. Some of us react positively, negatively because, you know, things are going on. We're feeling pulled on touch. We don't know what comes next. and Nobody likes that, right? Everybody likes to know what's coming out. We're used to three songs, an offering, and a message, and then pray a little bit and go home. And if God interrupts that, that ah, you know, it's a little sketchy. We got to be careful there because we don't know what comes next. What if singing continues and we don't know? What if there's another level that we don't get to because we're just really uncomfortable in that place there? You reached my comfort level, worship team. That's about as high as I can get on you. I'm not going anymore because I don't know what's next. And that hinders so much of what we do. So um, this is really a word about here, here we are and, and not only where we are, but where God wants to take us. So I'm going to be talking this morning on the thought defining the wine skin, but I want to read you this prophetic word and you can judge it. Um, and uh, they're going to have it up on the screen here for you to read with me. Um, it says, behold, you are truly a church in transition. This is a Kairos moment, a season of answered prayers. I'm transitioning you from a local church to a dynamic resource church. 
And you're going to hear those two terms used. I'm going to talk about the difference here in a minute. We're going to talk about what that looks like. Uh, much like I did in the book of Acts when I transitioned from Jerusalem, a local church, to Antioch, an apostolic resource church, where I could send apostolic teams who would establish and strengthen local churches. From this place, if we continue to learn to minister to the Lord, we will begin to experience deeper levels of glory. The preceding word of God will continue to change our vision. And as we get lost in your presence, we will no longer look through a glass darkly, but a fresh revelation of ancient biblical truths will reemerge, which will only add depth of anointing. And we will begin to see past our traditions and various lenses that we all see Christ through. And we'll corporately and individually begin to see him face to face. Amen. Thank you. This area is pregnant, spiritually speaking. In the gestation process, there's a quantitative time, chronos, which is chronological time, your wristwatch, which is usually 36 weeks. And much of what has taken place is not visible to the naked eye. But as that time nears, the transitions from a quantitative time to kairos time, which is those divine moments, those, those, those defining moments in our life, those times when something happens that didn't ever happen before, Chronos time is qualitative. It does not tally seconds, minutes, or hours, but it captures critical moments and appointed times. The working and life that has been taking place in private until now, labor pains begin. The baby begins to alert us that what was been hidden mostly is now getting ready for that Kairos moment. When the child emerges and is now a critical moment, a defining moment when Chronos and Kairos intersect and an opening appears which must be driven through with such force that success is to be seen. I read this again in the second and first service this morning. I don't you understand when Kronos, time that we live in and God's time come together, there's something that transpires, right? But for that to happen is God requires our cooperation. So I'm gonna read that again. Defining a moment when Kronos and Kairos intersect and an opening appears which must be driven through with such force if success is to be seen, that's our part. It's that prophetic intercession that we've got to stay in. I challenge you to stay focused on what I've asked of you individually and corporately. Continue to come up the mountain and allow me to let you see it as I see what I see through my eyes. The house will, this house will be known as Bethlehem, a house of bread. And as word spreads, many who are hungry, distressed, discontented, and in debt will come to be filled. Don't worry, I've sent and already have fivefold ministers who will come to build with you. Stay focused on the kingdom and ensure you're walking in cadence with me and don't allow Satan to distract you or turn you away for the simplicity that is in Christ or to self-interest. And we'll see something that I have not seen or ear heard. Man. <clears throat> Praise the Lord. Do it, Lord. Yes. And God's word be true. So as, as, we, as we talk today, I, I want to I wanna, go ahead and read the scripture so y'all feel like y'all been in church. Give me one second. Uh, because I'm going to quote a lot and say a lot, but everybody feels better when we read once. So we turn to Luke chapter 5. I'll read a scripture and then I'm going to probably not read again. Luke chapter 5, verse 37. So as we begin to, today, I want, I want to define the new wineskin. A wineskin is a paradigm, a pattern of thinking, a system, a structure. And God wants and is in the process of developing a new wineskin. He's in the process here of creating a new paradigm, a new pattern of thinking. He's bringing people from all various places, from all spiritual flavors, uh, from, from all different dynamics and backgrounds together. And it's wonderful. It's amazing, the diversity and the, when you just talk to different people where they're at spiritually, not just from a racial perspective or ethnic, but I'm, spiritually, people coming from so many different places and directions. And to see God bring it all as a melting pot together, it's just exciting to see what God's doing. Okay, let's, uh, let's read verse 37, Luke chapter 5. And no one pours new wine into old wine skins. If he does, the fresh wine will burst the skins and it will be spilled and the skins will be ruined and destroyed. But new wine must be put into fresh wine skins. And that's all I'm reading. All right. So next few minutes, I want to do my very best to give you the contrast and comparisons between what I'm going to call a good local church. And I'm using the book of Jerusalem as that model and a resource apostolic revival hub, Antioch Church. All right, so the first portion of Acts, if we read the first 12 chapters of the book, pretty much the main focus of the church is the church of Jerusalem, right? Church of Jerusalem, good godly people had an amazing revival. God moved in a powerful way. Not very diverse, they're mostly Jewish, right? Mostly Jewish believers, a few Gentiles mixed in, not a whole lot of diversity. But in Acts chapter 13, things change. The entire book of Acts 
shifts. There's a shift in the spirit. The Jerusalem church is not forgotten. God doesn't, no, no longer working through it, but God's doing a new thing. And in Acts chapter 13, it tells us that as Paul and Barnabas and three other folks were praying together, teachers and, and, and prophets, as a minister to the Lord, that the Lord said, now I want you to separate unto me Paul and Barnabas for the work that I've sent them for. Now we get an apostolic sending that goes forth. And from the rest of the book of Acts, the only thing Jerusalem is really known for is receiving stuff, needing stuff. They need, it's a constant need. Not a lot of reaching out, a lot more inward. Now a lot of that was due to persecution, other things I'm not bashing again. So let me make this preface as I did in the first service. I don't want you to, in, in any way, and I'm gonna sound unbalanced. I'm just letting you know ahead of time, right? Because uh, truth is often unbalanced at times. It sounds like we're just going one way. I love the local church, every local church. I'm not saying the local church is a bad thing. The local church is absolutely essential, but a resource church a revival hub is also absolutely essential. And it's that revival hub, that resource church that will take care of and make sure that those local churches have what they lack because they don't have access to the fivefold ministry. They don't have access to some of the things in the spirit that maybe God's doing here, but we can spread that to them so that all the church grows up. So I don't want you to think that I'm bashing the local church. That is not my intent. Listen, when I speak to Christ's bride and talk about Christ's bride, it's a really big deal. I'm a very nice guy, but if you mess with my wife, you're gonna see a side of me that you didn't think you saw before, right? So I understand that Christ's bride is Christ's bride and how I talk to her and how I respond to her is extremely important to the Lord. And so I, I don't wanna do anything in the world to put down the bride of Christ. So as we're talking, and I'm talking about the local church and the resource church, don't hear something I'm not saying. I'm not bashing and saying it's wrong. I just wanna show you, I believe, what the new wine skin that God's wanting to do here looks like. Everybody with me on that? Everybody okay with that? Okay. All right, I want to throw that out there because the rest of the thing is going to sound completely unbalanced uh, and that's on purpose. Uh, <clears throat> remember this, God will never feel what he himself has not formed. He's not going to feel it. And God loves the old wineskins. He loves them so much that he has to withhold what he wants to do in them because he knows if he sends his new wine into that wineskin, not only is the wine going to be wasted, but the bottle will be burst. That's what it says, right? The bottle will be burst. God loves those people. That's why every now and then he still visits them. He still shows up. He cares about them. But if the, God is also a God of order and he's a God of progression and revelation. So if we're not building in the new wine skin, we can't contain the new wine. So God is wanting to construct a new wine skin that can hold this last day revival that he's gonna pour on the earth. Let me tell you something. It, it, God's not coming back for anything less than what he left, right? <laughs> and he left a church that was... Healing the sick, casting out devils or shadow on people made him. He's not leaving for some weak and anemic church. He's not coming back for a weak and anemic church. He's coming back for a church as, as a fiery bride. She's full of the power. She's hungry for him. That's the bride he's coming for, right? And so we, we need to realize that, that, that the bride of Christ now is, needs to make herself ready. We need to be prepared. We need to put on our, we need to make sure we've got every spot, every wrinkle, every blemish. When I got married December the 4th, 2004, and that beautiful woman walked down the aisle, there was nothing else in the world but that beautiful bride walking down. There wasn't a spot on her. Beautiful. And I'm thinking, am I in the right room? She's coming down here with me, right? God is bride. He's wanting her to make herself ready because he's, he's been waiting for eternity for this to take place. So God will not feel what he's not formed. He's not going to pour new wine into old wineskins. So here's the dilemma. We've got to create a new wineskin. Now, we'll get into this, but let's don't start trying to create one because that's where we get in trouble. We'll allow the Holy Spirit to create one, and we're going to just cooperate with him. He's pretty good at doing his own business, I found out. He really doesn't need my help. He needs my cooperation. That's all he needs from me. Right? I'm more of an impediment to him sometimes than a blessing. So we've got to find out what he's doing. So I'm going to do some comparison contrast here, and I'm going to tell you some things that I believe define and are kind of present in a local or traditional church. And then I'm going to tell you the things that I believe are going to be necessary and vital for a resource or revival hub church. Okay, can you stay with me on that? So we're going to kind of define a little bit where there's no vision, the people perish. So we all know something's happening. Most believers, to some degree or another, feel something stirring, right? We all know something's coming. We just don't know where it's coming from. We don't know what it's going to look like. And it causes, it causes anxiety in a lot of us. Some of us, it causes fear. God doesn't want you to have any of those feelings. He wants you to have faith. He wants you to just... Throw your arms back and just jump off the side of the mountain and know that he's going to be there to catch you and he's got everything under control. You don't need to worry about something bad happening to you, right? Or I'm going to get the wrong thing. 
Listen, we have more faith in Satan to deceive us than we do Christ to reveal truth to us, and that has to change. If I ask for bread, he's not going to give me a stone. If our hearts are right and we're saying, God, we want you, we want your presence, we want you to move, we want you to come, and guess what he's going to give me? He's going to give me his presence and he's going to come because he's a good father, right? He's not going to give me a serpent. He's going to give me bread. So we need to, first off, sometime get rid of that fear that, you know, listen, I don't know what's going on. It's a little, you know, weird around here, these folks. You know, prophetic people in particular in the congregation, we can be a little weird sometimes. So it's like, what's going on with them? You know, <clears throat> listen, I wish that all God's people were prophesying, they would have prophesied. God wants the entire body of believers to prophesy. We all need to be a little nuts. It's okay. There's nothing wrong with it. Right? We need to express who we are in Christ. We don't need to try to conform to what everybody else thinks we need to be. Good Lord, be yourself. God created you to be an individual. Let that individualism come through. Let it come through. God needs us to be who he created us to be. Quit trying to form into some religious mold of, listen, I got to act this way because I don't want to upset anybody or worse yet, I don't want to embarrass myself. Listen, worship was created for you to embarrass yourself. It's supposed to bring death to you. You're supposed to feel awkward. Everything God does is to kill you. Everything he creates is to kill you. Worship and praise were sent to kill you. Kill your pride. Kill what people think about you. Kill what you think about yourself. And when you start just going after it, you're spitting and snotting in your arms and you don't care what anybody else thinks. You're just going after it. God help us to do that. All right. It's a sign. It's not on my notes. That's for free. All right. So a local church enjoys seasonal outpourings. They'll have seasonal times. God will come and visit, but he doesn't come and stay. You've been in those churches, you have a time, church is good, you'll have some meetings, and you can look back with them, you can almost count how many you had during that year because they're not that often. I remember back in June, we had this. Back in October, we had this. They're seasonal outpourings. Why are they seasonal? Because God can only come and visit. He can't come and stay. But a resource church, they've created an open heaven. They've created an open heaven. You know how you get an open heaven? You die. It's exactly how you get open heaven. How did Jesus get open? He was the, the man, Christ Jesus. We are, who, who's his body now? We are. So if we walk through the Jordan, which means descent to death, and we're baptized with Christ and we die and we come up from that water, what's gonna happen? The same thing that happened to Christ. The heavens are gonna be rented to. And he's gonna come down with his Holy Spirit and move in our midst. Because God cannot resist the smell of death. That flesh burning, our flesh when it burns, when, we're, when we embrace the cross and allow it to kill our self-centeredness and our pride and all the things that keep us from him, he, that he can't help but be drawn to it like a magnet. You want God in your life? Start repenting. Start getting God to look at every hidden corner of your heart. God, expose anything in me that's unlike you. You want God in your life? Get out and let that begin to happen. He will pursue you like a hound dog. He'll be all over you because it draws him. He can't resist the smell of it. Can't resist the smell of it. So they create an open heaven for continuous refreshing and outpouring. This leads to them creating a mercy seat, right? Where's God's throne in the Old Testament? It was on top of the Ark of the Covenant, sat a golden piece, well, gold, pure gold, beaten with two angels at the end on top of the mercy seat. Our Ark of the Covenant was the mercy seat. And that was God's throne. That's where his Shekinah glory would come in that blue flame, Right? Because that, that was his seat. So I told the story again this morning of a, a gentleman, minister, a great man of God, I heard years ago, uh, said this. And he, he was a very large man. And I, when I say large, I mean, you know, a very large man. And when he would come to people's homes, before he had sat on their chairs and things and they had broken and he was embarrassed. And we want his glory, right? Well, the word glory in Hebrew is kabod, which means the weightiness of God, the heaviness of God. So when he would come in a room, the first thing he'd look for, is there anything here that can support my glory? Is there anything that can support my weight? Because I'm not coming into another place where I break a chair. I don't want to visit. All right? So he starts scanning the room. And he so desperately wanted to fellowship with these people. So desperately wanted to get to know them. But I'm not going to break another chair. I'm not going to embarrass myself again. We've got to prepare a mercy seat where God comes and he knows they can hold the weight of his glory, right? We've got to prepare a mercy seat where God doesn't just visit. It's his spiritual lazy boy. He lays out that bad boy and he got his soda on one side. He's just relaxed. He's here with us. We don't have to ask him to come. We just come and enjoy his presence. That's what God wants. He wants us to create a mercy seat where he can come and stay. 
That's what happens during revival. Enough heartbroken people begin to repent and see this wickedness in themselves. There's nothing good in me. And they begin to really not just say that, but see that. And that humility and that brokenness creates a mercy seat. And God comes down and he does his, you know what? This feels pretty good. I can move around. It can support my weight. I'm going to get to stay with my people. I'm not going to have to leave. Could you imagine how it breaks the heart of God to only visit you once in a while? You were created to habitate with God. One of the most tragic stories in the Bible to me is Exodus 19 and 20. The children of Israel were brought out of bondage for a reason. God was getting ready to marry them. Brought them to Sinai to make the marriage covenant. He gave them the 10 requirements. And the Bible says, if you look over in Deuteronomy, that he read and said the 10 commandments to every one of them. They all heard his voice, not just Moses, like Cecil B. the Mills shows. It wasn't just Moses, Charlton Heston that heard the voice. Every one of them, millions of people, they all heard the 10 commandments. They all heard the requirements for this covenant. And their response instead of yes, let's go. Was the Bible says they drew back and said, Moses, you go for us. Because if God speaks to us, we're going to die. Eh, that's a lie. You just heard him speak and you're all living. Right? So what, 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 what was the darkness inside of them was being revealed by the light. See, when the glory comes, that darkness is going to be revealed by light. You can't hide anymore. That closet of sin that you've hidden forever, that thing you do, nobody else does you do, is not going to be able to hide anymore. You can get by with certain things when God visits. But when he's here, when he's in his house, and it, it is his house, right? It's not my house, not your house. I don't care how much tithe you pay or how long you've been here. This is God's house. And when God's here, you can't get by with certain things that you could when he's visiting. Just ask Ananias and Sapphira. Right? When God's there, it's not a good idea to go lying in front of God. Well, we sold a piece of land. Well, that's fine. Nobody asked you to. Just give whatever you feel in your heart to the Lord. No, we gave everything. Ananias falls dead. Well, Brother Roger, that just sounds mean. Why did God do that? Because again, you could get by with certain things when God's not present. You could have got by with that about two years before that. But at that moment, when Father's in the house and the glory is there, every hidden thing is revealed. Well, Sapphira didn't get the note. She comes in and tells the same story. Now, you can imagine how that felt probably affected the church, right? Everybody's like, oh my gosh. But the Bible says that the fear of the Lord came upon the church and the church continued to grow. And God started winnowing out those that were really his and those that were really just there to first show and be a part of something new. Right? So you can get by with certain things, but God wants to have a habitation. And that resource church, that revival hub is a place that says, you know what? We're not happy with that. You know, what would happen, and again, humor me for a minute, because I got plenty of time now, so that's great. Humor me for a minute, and what would happen if we genuinely didn't move until God came? Listen, God, we didn't come to hear Brother Jeff, who's one of the best preachers I know. I came to hear Brother Roger. We didn't come to hear Brother Kip. We, we came here for you, and, and we're not leaving until we get what we came for. So God, we're, we're asking you to let us sense and feel your presence now. Be present with us now. Heal people now. Deliver people now. What would happen if we made that kind of determination? Well, the problem is we know how to do church. So if he doesn't move after about three songs, we're going to the offer and the message, and I'll go home. Because we know how to do things without God. We're really good at it. Right? We're really good. It's called soulish ministry is what it's called. We're all very good at it. God, if you don't show up, we got a plan B. What if we didn't have a plan B? What if God took away our plan B? I pray to God he would take away our plan B. Take it away, God, unless you come, we're helpless, we're useless, there's nothing good for us. We need you, God. We're hungry for you, God. Nothing else will satisfy us. Nothing else is going to quench my thirst but you. Oh, God. God, that God's people would get hungry again. Our spiritual appetite causes us to push up and get a little bit on Sunday morning, a little bit on Wednesday night. We get our spiritual appetite met, we come back next week. I don't know if you may have met anybody that's really hungry. Really hungry, not, not an appetite, not because I just didn't eat. We got off, the wife and I were on a vacation last week. We went on a cruise. You eat way too much on a cruise. I love every minute of it. I'm planning on dieting starting January. But I was never hungry. But I got used to eating whenever I wanted to, so I had an appetite. So the first thing you do when you get off the boat is, where's the nearest restaurant? 100% <laughs> true story. Was we, we're in New Orleans. We get off the boat. We had to find a restaurant. We found them. Great place called Mambo's, by the way, in Louisiana. On Bourbon Street, really great gator tail. Anyhow, we weren't hungry. We had an appetite. What would church look like if we had a real hunger? Because hungry people, they don't mess around. 
My life depends on this. Have you ever seen them drop food into third world countries? Those people aren't standing in line. They're walking all over each other. Listen, if you don't want what God's got for you, then tell him to give it to me because I'm hungry. I want that hunger in me. If you don't want it and you think it's coy and it's something you can do without, then I don't know what's wrong with you. But if you don't want it, there's a lot of people here that do. There's a lot of spiritual food to go around. God wants us to be hungry. And that resource church, they open the heavens. They, they, they really begin to repent and they begin to have a habitation of God. Second thing a local or traditional church does, they focus on local church life. Just our four, no more, right? We've got to take care of what we got here until Jesus comes. God help us from that. Our four and no more and everybody else. But it, it's easy to do. I've been a part of those churches. They, they got so much love, so much compassion, and they're so, so tight that anybody comes, they don't feel like they can get in because there's such a group there and you feel like an impenetrable wall. I want to get in here, but I can't. You guys are such a tight knit group. So that local church creates that. And is, is that important? Absolutely. Again, I'm going to sign off balance. We need to have tight groups in church. We need to have pastoral care in church. But if a pastoral grace is the one leading your church, you're never going anywhere. Because pastoral grace, they're, they're not for advancement. They're for sustaining who we have. We have to have apostolic leadership that will, that will be warriors that will go before us. So that this is the way. We're going this direction. Follow me as I follow Christ. <laughs> pastoral care is more about nurture. And again, as we go along and follow Christ, we're going to need nurtured. Some more than others. We're going to need it. We're all going to be wounded at some time. We're all going to need prayer. We're all going to need to be weak and vulnerable with each other. So I'm not negating that. But at the same time, God didn't call us to be a bunch of crybabies. He called us to be a bunch of warriors. Right? He told us to put on the whole armor of God. Put on the whole armor of God because he knew there's a fight. We've got to fight. You think God, that Satan's going to lay still and let God do what he wants to do in this place without resisting it? What planet are you from? Of course he's going to resist it. But he doesn't mind the comfortable people in a comfortable church where God's not really doing anything. He's not really worried about those folks at all. In a lot of traditional churches, that's how it is. We have the way we do things. Don't upset the apple cart. Everything needs to run smooth. I need to know what's happening next. I need to be able to be comfortable. I need the chairs just right. I need the air on. I need, and if I don't get it, I'm going to complain about it. Right? Because everything's about me. I never read in the Bible where there's a spiritual buffet and you can pick what you want off of everything. So I don't know where that came from, this seeker friendly church. This is God's house. And the person that should be most comfortable in this house is God. It's God, not you, not me. <laughs> everything should be built around that focus. We've got the wrong starting point, that's why. If you ask most people, where's the starting point of history? They're gonna go back to the Garden of Eden. That's the furthest thing in the world for the starting point. Paul goes back and says, listen, in Ephesians, before the foundation of the earth, God purposed in his heart. God didn't react because Adam sinned. Oh gosh, I need to do something now. Adam screwed it up. God already had everything in place before it ever happened. Man's sin has become the central focus of who we are. And our starting point is the garden. Our starting point has to be the father heart of God who in himself purposed that I want to have sons and daughters that will come forth in the earth. And I want him to look just like my son. That's what he wanted. That's what he wants. But we focus on the sinful part in the garden and we, and we bring everything back to man. Huh. I'm going to let you soak that one in for a minute. Because we all do it. Everything comes back to man. No, everything needs to come back to God. And when it comes back to God, you'll know it. And God will bring order and divine alignment and his movement and his spirit and things that you want, things you've read about will start happening. Listen, God wants us. To, I'm tired of reading history books. I'm tired of reading about revival. I want it. I want it. Right? I want it. I, I, I don't want to keep praying for people that are not getting healed. I don't want to keep sinners continue to hear a message that doesn't convict them. Why aren't sinners running up to us saying, what must I do to be saved? Is there not enough glory in our life that they feel the presence of the Holy God? Okay, let me get back to my notes. <clears throat> I promised I would try not to chase too many rabbits. Local churches focus on ministry to the community. The resource church focuses on people, but their primary focus is on hosting the Holy Spirit. A regional church. Next point, local or traditional churches, they birth and create programs to address the needs of people. 
Listen, if programs would have saved the world and brought revival, it would have happened a long time ago. <laughs> right? Anybody better been on a board where you have programs? <laughs> we got to do this and this and this. Because we went to this conference and this church conference. They told us if we do this, this, and this, we're going to get this. A plus B equals C. And then they go back to their church and they try to do the same thing and it doesn't get anything. There's a reason it doesn't get anything. God never told you to do it. What if God is so diverse, and just bear with me, that he's actually not limited by what you think, by what you feel, or by what you know? Just, again, just humor me. And what if God can do a purposely new creative thing in every body of believers in the earth? And how wonderful that would look like. What if that happened? I believe it will. I believe it will. I believe there's going to be a people of God that are willing to say, God, there's some things about that we, we, that we can see in this movement where you're doing in ours, but you're also doing something new. I love to go visit revival places. I've been to Brownsville, been over to Dawsonville. Listen, what they're doing in Dawsonville, God's moving in. But he didn't tell us to put a tub up here and baptize everybody. We're not against it, but we're not going to do it because somebody else is doing it. Is God moving that way? Absolutely. God can move any way he wants to and never ask my permission, not one single time. But we can't go trying to take the same thing and make it work because it worked for everybody else. Then we wind up in the same mess the children of Israel did. So we all know the story. They complained about God and, and just what was going on. And they were murmuring. God sent fiery serpents down and bit them. The only way they could be healed was to look at this golden serpent, this brazen serpent which is, again, a whole paradox we could talk about. But it's a brazen serpent raised up. And if they looked upon it, they would be healed. Man, that must have been awesome to see. Can you imagine being part of that movement? You know? So I'm sure people, you know, wanted to make their own brazen serpents and try to get God to come. I'm sure people would do it. Problem is, 400 years later, Hezekiah becomes king in Judah. And he's walking through the temple. He looks over and he sees something. There's some incense burning to this brazen serpent. He says, what is this? That's the brazen serpent. That's how God moved 400 years ago. We still have, we're burning incense. We're worshiping that. That's precious. And Hezekiah being the politically correct guy he was, picked it up and broke it to pieces. Right? And said, this is Nehushtan. This is a piece of brass. It's a piece of brass. I'm not, God's not moving that way anymore. So quit trying to duplicate it. I'm not moving in that way. Flow with me. Move with me. God was consistently moving on purpose. He doesn't want, the only time your body is truly balanced is when it's standing still. So we're always going to be a little off balance. We're all going to be a little weird sometimes, but God will bring us back to our true north and we'll keep moving forward as we pursue him. So that, that revival hub, they won't worry about programs, right? Because what they're going to do, they're going to dig spiritual wells. I don't need programs. Just give everybody a pickaxe and let's start digging. Right? Because what's beneath us is water. What's beneath us is revival. What's beneath us is life. And it's going to require something of us. So we get up our spiritual pickaxes and we just all go at it. And when you get tired, you know what you do? Because it's body ministry. You give the axe off to the next fellow. Listen, my back's hurting. I got, can you help me for a minute? And everybody just keeps chipping away. And we may not see nothing today. We may not see nothing tomorrow. But all of a sudden, you may be a, see a hand in the sky, the size of a man's hand, right? Like Elijah told the king, listen, I see the size of a man's hand in the sky. It's going to rain. And all of a sudden, that's all thing that you see, that little drip of water that comes up becomes a mighty flood and revival breaks forth. So resource churches, they get their spiritual pickaxes out and they say, listen, we're not going to settle for anything less than the living water. I don't want to drink out of broken cisterns that leak. I want to drink out of a living well. I want that life of God to come out of it. In Jeremiah 2, he talks about it. He says, the people are, are committing two evils. And one of the evils was you're drinking water out of broken cisterns, things that hold water. Man's way of containing water that only becomes stagnant. And he says, listen, you've, you've, you've refused the wells of living water for this cistern, something you made, something you control. That's the thing that scares us about God is we can't control him. That terrifies us. What, what will he do next? Who knows? What would that look like? I don't know. Are you in? Yes. Let's do it. Let's go. Let's go after God. Let's go after God no matter what it costs us. If it costs something you enjoy, if it costs something you like, let's go after God. Let's get our spiritual pickaxes out. And the resource church, they're not going to settle for anything less than the true living water. A local church, traditional church, a Jerusalem church, 
They may have growth. They, they focus on growth and attendance, their central focus. and They keep the people comfortable so they'll come back. If you aren't drawn by the word of God and the spirit of God of this place, you don't need to be here in the first place. Right? There's a place for everybody. And we want everybody. We're not trying to be exclusive. But we're also not going to build programs to make you feel good. We're not going to try to placate you and do things just so you'll keep coming. If the presence of God and the word of God are not enough to bring you here, then maybe you're not in the right place. And there's nothing wrong with that. But listen, we're not trying to, to, to do everything to, to, to lure you in. These seeker friendly churches, we want to kind of lure them in here. We're going to tell them what great kids ministry we got, which we need kids ministry. I'm not, none of this is saying we don't need it. I'm just throwing this out there. And we're going to reel them in with this. We're going to have a five minute promo on Facebook. It's going to pop up and we got to tell everybody we're different than every other church. It's not church as usual around here. If you got to tell people that, then uh, I'm just saying, right? If you got to tell people it's not church as usual around here, then you're probably in the same rut everybody else is in, right? And the last dying words of any church is we've never done it that way before. So you're in the same rut with everybody else if you've got to advertise it that way. But that's the way the, the local church, the, the Jerusalem church will advertise. They got to make everybody comfortable. We don't offend anybody. Listen, if truth reveal, reveals, cuts to the heart and reveals something in you, I was pierced this morning during worship. I had to repent this morning during worship. They would, the worship was so real and his presence was, and I could just feel the word just piercing my heart. If we're not being pierced by the word of God and by worship, if we're not, are, are our hearts too ardent? Have we, have we given ourselves over so much to our soulish desires that we've allowed our tender heart become a stony heart. If we have, I have good news for you. The word of God comes like a hammer and he's ready to knock that stone off of you and give you that living, breathing, pumping heart again and let that tenderness return. Let that simplicity that you once knew, the thing that you used to wake you up in the middle of the night. I couldn't understand when I first got saved how everybody didn't feel like I felt. And I probably wasn't the wisest person in the world. So I'm not advocating this. It's in a small little church. Green Ridge Church of God. And we were mostly, this is not knock against people, older people, because I'm one of them now. But back then I wasn't. Mostly older folks. I was like one of the younger people. And God was moving so much during one of the worship services. And I'm looking around and I'm thinking, are you guys not in the same service I'm in? Are you, are, am I doing wrong? I don't know. I just, I'm so hungry for him. And I remember getting up that night and I said, listen, if you don't want God, God's got for you. Would you tell him to give it to me? Because I'm so hungry and so desperate for him. Now, again, I'm not advocating and that was immaturity probably. It came from a great place. But, but we got to have that hunger for God. We got to get our hearts tendered again. It can't be callous. We need the word of God to come and to pierce us and to cause us to want to be changed in the image of Christ. So that revival hub will, uh, will make transformation the central focus, which means you're going to change and willingness to be uncomfortable is going to be the, the status quo now. It's going to be the way we do things. We're going to constantly move and not know what comes next and be okay with it because we're going to love each other, trust each other, and trust the Holy Spirit. And we're going to allow God to do what he does best, right? Manage his church. Next thing a local or traditional church will do, local churches work to be culturally relevant and add cultural norms into the flavor of ministry. There's one word I can take out of the English dictionary from the church the last 10 years is relevant. We've become relevant, all right. We look just like the world. I'm not talking about your britches and your hair. I'm talking about your lifestyle. I'm talking about the way we do things. We, we feel like we draw people in through the world. Let's make sure we got the right music, the right. We need to lure them in. Right? We don't want to be culturally. We don't want them to think we're uncool. So we got 75-year-old pastors wearing cut jeans with tennis shoes up here with T-shirts on trying to blend in. If I'm 75 with a t-shirt, y'all please pull me off stage with cut jeans. There's certain things that are just not age appropriate, but we're going to draw people in that way because we're going to be cutting edge. We're going to be relevant. We want them, to, we want them to, to, to see us and really want to be a part of it. The presence of God is the most relevant thing in this universe. And if you get him in the house, I promise you, you won't have to beg people to come. You start a fire and folks will come. And that prophecy I told you would be a house of Bethlehem. When, when people heard in Moab, which means a place where young men go to die, when they heard in Moab that there was bread in the house of Judah, in Bethlehem, the house of bread, you didn't have to say, listen, guys, we're just going to, everybody flung to Bethlehem because there's bread. 
And when people find out that there's a fire, that something's taking place over at Church at Winder, something's happening in the atmosphere, something's changing. You won't have to put out bulletins and advertisements. You don't try to appeal to the masses. So I hate the word relevant. I hate it. When people say it in church, usually it's something totally against what I believe. Resource churches challenge the culture. They engage in spiritual warfare and blast the ruling spirits and strongholds that have been established in the region. Satan's not going unless we push him out. Here's the fact of it. He's been here a while. And he thinks we're trespassing because this is his land, right? What are you guys doing over here? You see a trespassing sign? I've been here for some time now. This is my space. If you come to be a part of our prayer meeting, you'll hear a lot of people praying and declaring and prophetically saying things over Barrow County because they're saying, listen, we're fixing to evict you. This is not your land. This is not your place. Everything, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof and those are other in. This is our land. You're on private property and we're kicking you out. We're kicking you out. You have no right to be here. You have no right to be here. That's what a resource or revival hub will do. They're not going to sit and just, well, we're just going to gather here and the demons around us won't mess with us much if we just all kind of be relevant. Man. So we need to blast those ruling spirits out. They're not going out without a fight. Right? But that's okay because you know what we have? We have the armor of God. We have the sword of the spirit, the breastplate of righteousness, the helmet of salvation. We got our loins girded about with truth, our feet shod in the preparation of the gospel. We're ready for a fight. God is getting us ready for a fight. We're not there yet. So I don't want you to go engage in any principalities at this moment. But when we get ready, trust me, Satan will know. Right? Because if we go out prematurely, we'd be like the seven sons of Sheba in the book of Acts. They had heard about God. They even thought they believed God. This guy's got a demon. We're going to cast it out. They all left naked, running and screaming. You know what that demon told me? He says, Paul, I know. And Jesus, I definitely know. But who are you? Who in the world do you think you are? The enemy cannot be where he's allowed to be. Years ago, we, we went to a conference and came back. I don't know if you've ever heard of Claudio Friedzon, Carlos Anacondia from Argentina. Uh, powerful ministry and deliverance. And my youth pastor, and, or the worship minister, and I, I was youth pastor in the church at the time, back in the early 90s. We went to the conference, and uh, Brother Carlos came by and laid hands on me. I fell like a brick, and I got back up as quick as I could. I was getting in line again. I wanted everything God had for me. Because over there, they're, they're, they're declaring rebuking devil from three miles away, and people were getting out of hospital beds. If you haven't read about the Argentine revival in the 80s, you need to. It was amazing. So I got up again. Now... One guy beside me, he started manifesting demons, so they took him out to the tent so he could get delivered. We got back home that Sunday at church because you bring back certain things from other meetings. That's what we got to make sure of. There's, there's a res, re, residual anointing that'll go with you, but you didn't pay the price for it, so it's not yours. Did you get that? If you don't pay the price for it, it's not. You can read the book, 300 pages about a man's 20-year ministry, but you didn't pay the price for what he paid the price for, he or she. And so therefore, just because you read it don't give you the right and authority to think you got all of it figured out. Right? There has to be a working of that in your life. Imagine that. I've been serving God for 30 years. You just got born again. You're not supposed to have what I have. You're not supposed to. You haven't paid the price I paid for it. But you think you deserve it because you read my book and you listened to my DVDs. Well, we care back a residual anointing. And that Monday, well, I'm up in the staff office, and he comes in. He says, Roger, you got to come downstairs. They're manifesting. I said, what do you mean? Down in the middle of the floor, one of the most godly women you'll ever meet. She'd passed her for years, her and her husband, word of faith, and she was bought up in the fetal position. And I said, sister, I won't say her name. I said, what's going on? She looks at me. She says, you can't do this. And I felt that. <laughs> I felt it rise up on the inside of me. I'm thinking, you don't know who you're talking to right now. I just came from a meeting. I said, you can't do this. I've been here for 18 years. You can't do this. And we, we set her free. But things have sat in the church like that for a long time. And when light comes, all that darkness is going to be revealed. It's going to be revealed. And that's okay. You know what we did? We set her free. There's no judgment because we all have things we need free up. And she was so thrilled to be free from that. He'd been bound her for so many years. Sitting in church preaching the gospel. That can't happen. Of course it can. Of 
course it can. We have to take back what the enemy's stolen from us. How long has she struggled with that? God wants to redeem it. He wants to redeem time. He said, I'm going to restore to you all that the palmer worm, the canker worm, and the caterpillar have destroyed. I said, Joel 2, if you're reading your Bible, I'll give you a scripture. I don't think I have read from the Bible. Joel chapter 2. I'm going to to give it all back to you. God's going to do things. What took 30 years is now going to take 10. There's a season of divine acceleration coming to the body of Christ. I want you to hear me. There's a season of divine acceleration happening. If we'll only step into the water, if we'll only push away from the shore, if we'll only launch out into the deep, there's a divine acceleration that God wants to bring on this area. God wants to speed things up. He wants to redeem the time because the days are evil. All we've got to do is get on board with him. All he needs is a yes. All he needs is a yes. I'm in God. I want to be a part of it, God. What will it cost me? Everything. I'm in. I mean, you can have it all. I don't want any of it. Half the time, I don't want to be here on this earth. I'd rather be lost somewhere with you. Truth of the matter, I'd rather be somewhere with Jesus right now than standing up here. It's more of a burden than anything else. But we're all called to, to ministers. God's given us grace. So a resource church, they confront demonic powers. Whew. Local or traditional churches, your Jerusalem church, they may have a prayer meeting, but typically they don't view corporate prayer and intercession as the primary mandate. It's a program you add on because you have to have it. Where's prayer this week? I don't know. We need to move it from seven to eight on Tuesdays. Right? So it's just something you do. But for a revival hub, a resource church, it's the very lifeblood of what they do. They can't do anything without it. Because it's it's the very blood that pumps through their being. There has to be that corporate prayer life that we're birthing what God's doing. What you see here on Sundays should be a byproduct of what we're doing on Tuesday nights. What you're doing on Monday nights at home. What you're doing on that prayer, not just here on Tuesday night, but every night of the week. What you should walk into is a compilation of all the prayers and intercession that's come forth. And this meeting should be off the chain. We shouldn't have a break between services. The power of God should be moving so powerfully from one service to the next that we don't need a transition. We're just going to keep moving. So Resource Church, they build on the foundation of prayer. It takes the house of prayer mission very seriously. It'll sacrifice plans, resources, and programs for prayer. Listen, we can do this or we can pray. We're praying. But but, but the the area needs it. We're praying. But listen, what about this? People are going to leave. We're praying. This, this is going to be the format. We're praying. Out of that prayer, God will birth what he wants us to do. What if we stop doing everything God never told us to do in the first place? What would that look like? That terrifies us, doesn't it? What if God tell us? Did God really tell us to do that? Yeah. We could go into a whole different sermon on that. A lot of what we do is soulless, built out of mind, will, intellect, and emotions. It's not really birthed in the spirit. It's birthed out of need, desire. It's from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Right? We focus on the evil side of the tree of knowledge, but there's a good side. There's that part that looks okay. Nothing bad about that. It's okay if we have certain programs. God's welcome to visit with us. And there's the tree of life. God wants us to eat from the tree of life. Not the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Quit eating from that tree. Turn your back on that tree. Ask God, what am I doing in my life that you never told me to do? What have, what, have, what have I built in my life? What have I allowed to be built in my life that you never told me to do? People don't like to ask those kind of questions. But prophetic people, we enjoy it because sacred cows make the best steaks. So we like getting after those things. Ah, oh, I love it. Let's get after it. Let's kill that thing. Make a sacrifice. All right. Those sacred cows make sacrifices. Let's have God come. That's what God wants. So... They'll have the mindset of Jesus who twice, not just once in the Gospels, cleansed his house. In John chapter 2, the beginning of his ministry. And in Mark chapter 11, the end of his ministry. He comes to the court of the temple. Sees everybody buying and selling things. Wonders what's going on. Probably like he does in a lot of our churches on Sunday morning. What is this? Now, I love what John does. He gives us a great description. Jesus sits down. This takes time. You don't just do this in a second. He starts getting things together and he starts making a whip. Right, very deliberate. Just want one lay in there. I'm gonna just making a whip, and then he gets up in this loving Jesus, this Abba Father that we like to think of, that he's just cuddly and cute all the time. Gets that whip, and he says, "Listen, this is my house. 
and you've made it a den of thieves, a house of merchandise. This place is to be called a house of prayer. What are you doing here? And he begins to drive them out. Now, can you respond to a God like that? Can you, could, are you mature enough to, to understand a God who says, Moses, you're not quite ready. I'm going to let my people sit 40 more years in captivity and slavery because you're not ready yet. That seems awfully cruel. Why would God do that? Because he's God and he knows the beginning from the ending. He knows what needs to be done. He doesn't need you to figure it out. He doesn't need your consent. He doesn't need your agreement. He needs your participation. That's all he needs. That's all he needs. Makes no sense to me either. But you know what? I love that God. because that, that, that God will make you think about the fear of the Lord, which is something we don't have a lot of in the church anymore. But the fear of the Lord. Right? The fear of the Lord keeps us straight. I think it's Brother John in our group the other night said the fear of the Lord is like the rivers of the bank to keep us and keep everything from straight, keep us from going off. That fear of the Lord. So Jesus put the fear of the Lord in them and drove them out not once but twice. You know what I can hear right now? I can hear him putting another whip together. <laughs> in my ears, I hear it just as loud as I'm hearing you. He's putting another whip together. He's taking his time. This one's going to be bigger and better because he's got a lot more people to drive out. A lot more things that he needs to get out of his house that don't belong. Is it okay if I talk to you like this? I'm not mad at you. I promise. I promise I'm not. I love you. I love the church. I love the church so much. I want them to walk in truth. I want them to walk in freedom. I want them to walk in everything God has for them. And three points in a, in a poem is not going to get it done. Three steps to a better life is not going to get it done. A self-help book from a mega pastor is not going to get it done. What's going to get it done? It's personal repentance. Personal accountability. Going to people that you've wronged and saying, I'm sorry. Roger, that sounds radical. Yeah, it absolutely is. Humbling, radical. What would happen if we all just really started living our lives that way? Man, we'd see something. Next point, a local or traditional church is built on the senior pastor gift. They may have guests come occasionally, but they preach along the similar lines. Again, I'm not bashing pastors here. Don't hear what I'm not saying. I'm going to sound off balance for a minute because we've had pastoral ministry for so long that we don't know what apostolic and prophetic ministry looks like. Right? Well, you're going to start seeing it, so you need to open your eyes. God's brought it into the house. Right? We're going to see, it doesn't come like a pastor. Right? I'm not a pastor. I'm not going to sit by you and read Psalms and silk socks at your hospital bed. I'm not good at it. I don't have grace for it. Doesn't mean I don't care for you. Doesn't mean I don't want to be there. Don't mean I wouldn't be there. But, it's, you know, it's th those things get a pastor going. Somebody has a need and I can mean, God bless pastors. I thank God that I'm not one. They are so great. They give so much and love so passionately and so deeply. My love just comes off a little differently, but I still love just as deeply. Just so we're clear. But that one man ministry, funny thing about it, it's nowhere in the Bible. <laughs> I don't know about you, but when things aren't in the Bible, they upset me when we say they are. So there is no pattern for a one-man pastoral ministry in the New Testament or the first 300 years of the church. You can look at any book you want to and come to me. That's fine. We could have a discussion, but you'd be wrong because there's not. There was a plurality of eldership that led with a body ministry where every member was equipped to do their ministry Right? Not paying and expect somebody else to do something for them, but realize and develop and see who you are and what God's put in your life. And that fivefold ministry will equip you to do that and the kingdom could advance. So there's no biblical precedent for it to be alive. So let's shoot it and let's get it, bury it and put it in a coffin. It doesn't belong. Pastoral, pastors thinks in terms of safety and protection. The pastoral anointing should not be the dominant anointing in church should not be the dominant anointing. You need it, but it should not be the dominant anointing. Resource churches, they partner with, divine, with diverse voices and gifts in the body of Christ. They bring them into the area to make spiritual deposits. Apostles think in terms of expansion and progression. Right? They don't think like a pastor does. Why didn't so-and-so act like this one? Because he's not. And when you make him be somebody he's not, you become one of those statistics everybody likes to post on Facebook that 95% of pastors thought about retiring today. 20% of them thought about committing suicide. You, you, you see those old posts, haven't you? You know why? Because you're killing the man. He's, he doesn't have the grace for it. Do you want to do something you're not equipped to do? I'll give you a perfect example. We just came from Mexico. I snorkeled, by the way. The water was only up to here, but I snorkeled. The wife was out three times as deep. I handed my man card in. It was me and two ladies that didn't want to go out. So full disclosure, we're a body. We're supposed to be able to talk about it, right? So I wasn't comfortable. <laughs> I'm not a great swimmer. 
So I'm just thinking, the little Felipe, whatever his name was, the little guy there, real energetic, he was stoked. And he says, if you get in trouble, wave your arms. And I'm thinking, I'm gonna be the only person in this group of a bunch of women, and I'm gonna raise my hands that I need to rescue me. That's not gonna happen. My pride kicked in a little bit. And I'm thinking, there's a lot of pretty things here in the shallow part. <laughs> so I did see some fish. I did see little corals. I didn't see what my wife saw, but I did see them. And uh, anyhow, I don't know how I got off on that, but... Uh, <laughs> but apostles think in terms of expansion. Don't try to make somebody something they're not and burn them out. I'm not a scuba diver. There's a few things I know I'm not going to die from. I'm not going to die from sharks because I'm terrified of them, so that's not going to happen. Uh, unless my plane crashes over the ocean, I guess that's a possibility. But unless I, I'm not going out there where they're at. I don't swim good. And I would definitely draw them. As they say they drone to like a lot of motion, like a dying animal. And when I, when I swim, it's like an octopus on crack. It's all over the place. It's hard to look at. You're laughing. I'm being dead serious. Yeah. I'm being dead serious. It's not fun to look at. And I look up in the water and I've gone like three feet and I'm exhausted. It's not my grace gifting. I'm just not good at it. But imagine putting that on somebody that's not grace gifted to do that. How unfair have we been to pastors over the years, quote unquote? How unfair have we been to people? You didn't meet my needs. I'm leaving. You didn't do what I wanted you to. I'm out of here. Instead of saying, you know what? What has God graced you for? So I can receive a different way. Because the Bible says, and I believe it's Jesus in red print, says, if you receive a prophet in the name of a prophet, you receive a prophet's reward. Well, what's the prophet's reward? The benefit of his ministry. If you receive a saint in the name of a saint, you receive a saint's reward. He's very clear about it. So if I receive an apostle, whatever the gifting is, and I recognize that gifting in their life, I'm going to receive a reward from that, the benefit of their ministry. So I don't go to church and get disappointed because I'm not getting what I think I need to get. Instead, I'm realizing I need to change my focus, and this is, what, this is the anointing that's coming forth right now. And if I'm going to receive from that anointing, I need, to, I need to dial into it. And don't worry, we're going to help you start understanding what that looks like, because they all look differently. Right? They all love, they all full of faith and love, but they all look differently. So apostolic and prophetic lays the foundation, Ephesians 2.20. The foundation of the church is built on the apostolic and the prophetic ministry. So what does that say about our foundations? So now we need to get those pickaxes back out and start tearing some stuff up because we got faulty foundations. What we have now cannot support what God wants to do. It will not support it. Kathy and I were going to a conference back in June. I think it was June. Uh, Jeremiah Johnson conference. And I, I got up that morning. And, I mean, God gets on to me. I'm his child like anybody else. You know, he chastises me. There's only been a few times in my life where he talks to me and I, he really gets my attention. Like he's mad at me. You know how your mom got that certain tone in her voice or use your whole name? Roger Allen Henry Jr. I know I'm in trouble then. Well, he used my whole name. And he told me, he said, you're not ready for what's coming. And I'm thinking, I'm pretty cutting edge, I think. You know, I read the right books. I'm praying. I'm, I got my heart. How am I not ready? You're not ready for what's coming. So I started looking at my life and looking at things in my life. What was God talking about? Listen, what if this church grew from 300 to 3,000 tomorrow? What would that look like? How are we going to disciple this group of people? What's that? Are we ready for what's coming? When people come in here and they're not just asking, can I, can I come to y'all? They're up here and say, what do I got to do to be saved? They're not taking no for an answer. What if we have dem massive Damascus Roads experiences all over Barrett County and people come into the church with scales on their eyes and say, listen, I saw a light from heaven and I heard a voice. I don't know what it meant, but somebody explained to me what happened. Are we ready for that? Are we, ready? are we ready for a bunch of Mormons who, who are doing everything to make us look so bad the way they go passionately? I, they challenge me because they're going in error and they're still that passionate. What if a bunch of them got saved? Oh my gosh, you're talking about a group of evangelists. But what if a group of them come in here and say, listen, we've seen the light. What we're seeing is not right. Show us the way of salvation. Are we prepared to house, not only physically, but, but equip those people to do the work of ministry? No, we're not ready. But we can be. We can be. And that's what God really did. You're not ready, but you, you will be. And I want you to, you will be. If your heart's right, you, we will be. God can trust us with it. Listen, God can't trust everybody with everything because he's a good father. There's certain things you'll let your 12-year-old your -year do, you won't let your two-year-old do. All right? My boy used to get mad about it. There's four-year difference. I make him go to bed at eight, but I let my daughter go to bed at nine. 
I tell him he needed more sleep. I needed more sleep because he was very energetic. So I needed him down an hour earlier so Dad could get down, down a little earlier. And that was our little secret. He never knew, but yeah, I told him he needed more rest. So he grew up believing that. But he always said, what was this? Sissy don't go to bed this time. Your sister's older, son. You know, that's, uh, you just need to take what daddy says, go to bed. Don't let me hear you get up again. So we can trust. We want God to trust us. We want to be trustworthy. And God's watching us right now. We're being measured and weighed. Are you hear me what I'm just saying right now? Because I, I, I want you to hear me because I'm, I'm speaking something I want you to hear. We're being weighed at the moment. We're being evaluated. What can I trust Church at Winder with? Where are they at on that level of preparation? I want to do this, but if I do this, will it destroy them or will it fill them? <laughs> God wants us to be ready. Next thing a, a traditional church will do, they're comfortable with leaders and positions, but everything is governed through a pastor and a church model does not necessarily embrace. We just talked about that. Um, let me just say this too. The fivefold is not optional for where we're going. It's mandatory. Just like prayers of lifeblood, fivefold ministry is going to be essential for the wineskin. It's got to happen. Okay, whether you like it or not, it's got to happen for the wineskin. If you want what we're talking about, we've got to embrace the fivefold ministry. Because the fivefold ministry is not get up here so you can give to us, so that you can do for us, so that you can do any, be anything for us. The fivefold ministry job is to do everything we can for you, to equip you. A Greek word, it's kartismos. It means to, to, to put together, to be in alignment with. It's used in medical terms for broken bones being put together, getting people properly aligned together. Saying, you know what? You two belong together. And this, you, you know what? And, you, and they call out giftings in people's lives. Things that you had in your heart you only thought about, nobody else knew. All of a sudden, you feel it coming up on the inside of you. Some of you are going to dream dreams again. God's, permission, God's given permission for some of you to dream again. I want you to hear that. He's given some of you permission to dream again. If you could do everything, somebody asked me this years ago, says, if you could do anything for God and know you wouldn't fail, what would it be? I want to ask you the same question. Today, when you go home, if you could do anything for God and know you couldn't fail, what would that be? And you go after that. Because that's probably, passion is usually permission. If there's a passion, there is usually permission there. What, is, what could you do for God if you knew you couldn't fail? What would that be? What would that look like? And you start moving toward that mark. God, help us that we don't have markers along the way so we can progress, show our progression and lead us. God, this is what I'm after. I'm after you first and foremost, God. Not replacing that. But as I go after you, God, this is what I want. This is what I feel. And you begin to slowly move toward that goal until we step into our destiny. And now we're no longer talking about it. We're not one of many voices. We're like John the Baptist. I am the voice. I want crying in the waters. I embody the message. The message is not separate from me. It is me. I am the voice of one crying. That sounds kind of arrogant, John. You should really think about what you're saying. No, John knew exactly who he was. And on the flip side, because he knew who he was, he wasn't threatened by somebody else. John, listen, I mean to be the bearer of bad news. Jesus is baptizing more people than you are. Gosh, we got we to have a campaign. Everybody get on social media and let's send out messages. We're having baptisms today at three o'clock. Everybody come. He said, didn't I tell you it's forgetting I'm not the one? I know exactly who I am. I have sent to prepare the way. I've been sent to raise the valleys and bring down the mountains and make a straight path for the king. That's who he is. This is who I am. I must decrease so that he might increase. God's going to raise up people in this last hour. They're going to have one message for the church and disappear in obscurity and never be heard from them again. And they're going to be okay with that. If you've ever been used by God, it's addictive. It's like a drug. I'd rather preach and eat. It's the best feeling in all the world. I'm going to collapse today when I go home probably. But it's the best feeling in the world. It's a drug and we get addicted to it. But what if God says, Roger, I want you to preach this next time and I don't, you're not going to be heard from ever again. Are we willing to take that? Or do we feel like we have to have a certain thing. We've got to lay our selfish ambition and pride to the side. God, who are you choosing me to be for this season? And whatever that is, I'm going to be it. And if God chooses to exalt this brother for a season and bring me down here, to, God, what, it's not really what, it really doesn't matter to me. What matters to me is him and following that plan. See, a lot of people are looking for a platform. If you're looking for a platform, you need to repent right away in the first place and get on your knees. Because if you're looking for a platform, your hearts are in the wrong place. 
A platform should be a burden to you. It shouldn't be something that you just want to go fighting for. Social media gives people way too much authority that God never gave them. People get on there and teach and preach about stuff they know nothing about. But they have a platform. Listen, the Bible says a man's gifts makes room for him. And it will bring him before great people. A man's gifts make room for him. He doesn't have to come in and tell everybody who he is and give out cards. I'm apostle, I'm prophet, I'm, uh, and give out to everybody. He doesn't have to tell everybody who I am. They should be able to see you by the spirit. They should be able to, I know who you are, I see. But we're not spiritually attuned enough for that yet, but we will be. We'll be able to look at people and know. Like Jesus, when he saw Nathaniel. Was it Nathaniel when he saw him out by the tree? He looked at him and said, I know exactly who you are. You're an Israelite at whom is no guile. I see you, son. I, you must be the Messiah. That little word of knowledge, that, that done it for you? Can you imagine? In the book of Corinthians, Paul said that unbelievers would come into our meetings and we would begin to prophesy to them and they would say, now we know that God is in you of a truth because we laid the secrets of their heart bare, things nobody else knew, things that only whispered in the nighttime, things that happened when they were a child. All of a sudden, it's being laid open before our eyes and they're seeing, hey, there's, somebody, there's something real in what's taking place here. There's a supernatural God. We need to manifest the supernatural. You're a supernatural being. You're not, if you're a Christian, you are a new creation. You're a supernatural being. Start acting like it. Start acting like it. We need to go out and we need to let the life of God come through in us. Oh, gosh, I'm sorry. It's getting a little late. I apologize. Last couple points here. Local churches are primarily teaching centers, communicating concepts, tools, and principles for living without actually training and activating the saints for the work of ministry. And we just talked about that. Saints ministry, finding what everybody is. And I want to share this last point. And if I can get our worship team to come up. Resource churches are equipping centers. They're not just a place to receive healing or prophecy, but a place to be equipped to heal the sick, and minister prophetically while there are radical moves of God's spirit to release gifts. It's also a strong focus on depositing and activating gifts. Resource churches have a generational mindset. And I want to end on this and I want you to hear me. I don't care what your theology is because we all have different feelings on it. But in the 1830s, a rapture doctrine came into the church that really hamstrung the church. It caused us to be immature because everybody was believing that at this moment, Jesus is coming back, so I don't need to do anything. And we quit investing in the next generation. We quit fathering. God's order has always been passed from father to son. And don't give me, I'm, I'm not being gender or neutral, I'm, I'm being biblical. I'm a bride of Christ, you can be a, a son or a father, right? You can be a male, I'll be a female. It's, it's not what I'm talking about, gender. The order of God is passed from father to son. That's, that's the way God's always done it. God's generational. I'm the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God thinks generationally. That mentality seeped into our church and caused us to not think about the next generation. Because why do I need to do that if I think Jesus will come back tomorrow? Now, could Jesus come back today? He can come back anytime he wants to. He's never asked my permission on a single decision he's made. But at the same time, I need to occupy till he comes. Right? I think Jesus, those words are in red as well as I remember too in the New Testament. Occupy till I come. That word occupy means work, do things. Not just sitting around waiting for a spiritual helicopter to pull you out because things are so bad in the earth. Listen, if you study history, you'll know things have been a lot worse in the earth. They got so bad at one point, Jesus had, God had to wipe them all out with a flood. Things aren't as bad as you think they are. And even if they are, God will keep you through it. But that mentality has kept us from thinking about the next generation. And so we don't have spiritual fathers and mothers anymore. We don't have people say, you know what? I see a gift in you. It's in seed form, but I see it in you. If you'll let me, I want to help you mature. I want to take you under my wing. I might not see what God's going to do next. It might outlive my days. But if you see it, if you see, we all want to be a part of what God's doing. And I want, oh man, I want this. But what if God chooses like he's done throughout history to do things with people that you thought surely they would be the one in that move, but they die and things go on. We got to invest in the next generation. We got to think generationally. We need to, because the, the anointing passes from father to son. And not only does it pass, but it increases. As that one father passes to one son, then the next generation, we move further. And one's father to one son, one father to one son, that generational blessing just increases and grows and grows and grows. Abraham was promised a son, but he didn't have anybody. He didn't have any children, but God said, count the stars in the sky. He never saw the promise, but he invested in the next generation. Isaac didn't see the promise. Jacob didn't see the promise. But I think we can all agree that God kept his word. 
We've got to start thinking of the next generation. What can I do to invest in the next generation so that I can help them to be prepared what God's doing? In this house, we need to be thinking of our leadership the same way. We don't have to bring people inside and outside. We should be producing sons in this house that when the father moves on, the son just rises up. The vision doesn't have to change. I was brought to a denominational church every two to three years. We brought a different preacher. He took us a different way, this way, that way. We never knew where we were going. We were going to be great in 98 or down in 99, whatever the slogan was for that year. So we were all over the place. There was no constant vision. And where there's no vision, the people perish. They cast off restraints and live recklessly. The vision of this house is to produce sons and daughters of God that will take to the next generation and increase to the next generation. I may be looking at somebody here today that's going to be standing on this pulpit, being the head of this ministry, senior elder in this church. Maybe looking at them right now. You might be in seed form, but there you are. What are we going to do about it? Are we going to nurture them? Are we going to train them? Are we going to be, if I give away what I got, man, what will happen next? God will give you more. You can share your secrets. God give you, share everything you got and trust God that he's going to fill you right back up. Right? You don't have to hold on to anything. Let it all go. Let's stand to our feet with me if you would. I got more, but I'm going to stop because I didn't realize that was so long. I, I do, it was not intentional. I apologize. If you have to go, I understand. I, I won't be mad at all. But I do want, I, I, I do feel like this morning re- requires a response. As I've tried to contrast to the best of my ability what a local church looks like and what a resource or revival hub looks like and us being in that revival hub, sort of some semblance of what that wine skin would look like. I want to ask you this morning. Prophetic can be spoken. Things can be shared. But if there's no buy-in, then nothing's really taking place. So this morning, I want to ask everybody that can to come up front. If you don't, if you're going, there's going to be an honor for you to give them your seat. But if you could, come up front. And I want us to use our prayer team. If you want to come, Sister Jane. I want us, and if you have needs, definitely uh, get prayer for it, but I'm not going to be praying specifically for needs, but if you need prayer, our prayer team will pray with you. But this morning, I, I, I'm, I'm looking for a response in your heart, in you. God, I want to be a part of that. God, I, I want that model. I want that wineskin. And God, as I come up, I want to give you everything that I've held back. Anything in me, any darkness in my life, shine your light. So this morning, if you, if, if you have a yes, a resounding yes in your heart, would you come forward? Would you just come forward as a sign saying, God, I'm giving you my yes. I'm giving you my yes, Lord. I don't know what it all looks like yet. And our brother Rogers talked about it. He only sees in part and knows in part. But I'm giving you my yes, Lord. I'm giving you my yes because I will not sit at the table and be hungry anymore when you're here. God, I pray this morning, right now, God, as people have responded, that you create a hunger in our church, a hunger in this house, God, for everyone, God, here this morning, Lord. I'm asking you to instill a hunger in them that cannot be not be met, God, besides you, that they would be satisfied with nothing else but you, that we would hunger for you so much that we don't only just push our plate back, but we, we stop doing some of the things we're doing and we prioritize you more because where we spend our time shows where our heart's at. God, we know it's going to require more of us than we've ever given before. But we're giving a yes today, Lord. We're giving our yes today, Lord. We're giving our yes today, and we ask you, God, to help us. We're like children groping in the dark, Lord, but we want you to lead us and guide us and direct us. We don't have all the answers, but we know the one that does. We don't know all the right places to go, but we know the one that does. We know the Lord is our shepherd, and we shall not want. We know that he'll lead us and guide us in the green pastures and beside still waters. And even when we walk through the valley of death, He's with us. We thank You for that, Lord. We ask today, God, as we, as we lift our hearts and our hands to You, God, we say yes. If you believe it, say yes. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. We give You our yes. We give You our yes, God. God, I pray You'd bring such holy fire and conviction upon everybody here today, God, that they would never be the same again, that You would mark them right now. God, by the firebrand of the Spirit, I pray you would mark everyone on their forehead for kingdom service. God, right now, God, Holy Spirit, by your Spirit, begin to mark your people. Begin to cause dreams to rise up again. Cause people to begin to discover what you've made them to be, who you've made them to be. Let them begin to understand sonship. 
Let them begin to understand what, what, what you want to do in the earth, Lord. Raise them up right now, God. Let your hand stretch upon them, God. Every one of them, God, bring that hunger. Bring that yes. Let it come from the depths of their being, God. Let it be not something they're just mentally assenting to, but something that rises up on the inside of them that can't be held back. Oh, God. Lord, today as we declare this, we declare on the enemy, you're a trespasser. You're a trespasser and you don't belong. This land belongs to God. This land belongs to God. Father, equip us. Make your bride re battle ready, God. Make us battle ready, God. Make us battle ready, God. This morning, God, equip your saints. Equip your saints. Raise up apostles and prophets, pastors, teachers, evangelists, helps ministries, administrators. God, raise them up in our church so that everyone can function in the grace of their life and not be worried about what somebody else is doing, but just be simply fulfilled on what you've called them to do. God, I thank you for that today, Lord. We thank you for that today, Lord. We thank you for that today.